Hi there. Hi. I'm Scott Rokenberger, and I'm a ski of all life. <laughs> I hit rock bottom last September. It was sunny and 80 degrees down in Seattle. People were out boating, camping down by the river, going fishing. And I was up on Mount Rainier on a glacier trying to ski the worst snow imaginable. <laughs> now, to even call it snow is a little bit literal. It was really just ice embedded with volcanic rock and then a nice, good, even covering of sand. It looks something like this. <laughs> now, why on earth would someone subject themselves to something like that, you're asking yourself? Well, I was asking myself that at the same time. But that moment, and the single greatest sunset I've seen in 34 years on planet Earth, happened within 12 hours of each other in almost the same place. Here's that sunset, guys. And every time I pull this up, I can't help but look at it and think about how spectacular it is. How the entire piece of sound is covered in a bed of clouds, the sun's going down in front of every face, every color is a rainbow. Over on the far east horizon over there is actually a full moon coming up at the same side at the same time as the sun is going down. And we're up there all alone on this ridge to take it all in. And the reason we're up there is to get turns in August and September. And it was at that moment that I realized that skiing all year round was about a whole lot more than skiing. So for some of you guys, this is gonna be old news. I bet a lot of people in this room have skied 12 months of the year. Raise your hand if you ski 12 months of the year. Alright, I've got a couple of you. How about 24 months? Anybody made it two years? No, no makers for two years. Sometimes I talk to folks and uh, you know I feel pretty good. I'm like, oh I made it, uh, I made it 12 months and oh yeah, 68, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> but what's your name, sir? Yeah. Ben, how many months have you got? I'm just under 12. Actually, I got to September. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and you made it? Uh, yeah. I'm just a ski hall, just like you. Uh -huh. We ski yesterday. It was fantastic. Excellent. What's your name? Craig Miller. Craig Miller. How many months have you made it, Craig? Uh, about 12. About 12? Cool. And that's a huge commitment. Why did you do that? I love the back of the skiing and the outdoors and the best days. The scenery is incredible. The friendships. Yeah, all of that, all of that is what you come across when you go out and you keep skiing throughout the course of the year. And thank you very much. You guys are both a huge inspiration, and there's an entire culture in this region that's a huge inspiration that just can't get enough of going skiing and keep it going all year round and tell stories about it. And in the footprints of those folks and inspired by those folks, I decided to take on my own project to ski 12 months in a year and also to create an art project around it, uh, which is an image from each of the months of the year that uh, helps tell that story. Now you might say to yourself, boy, ski in 12 months a year, that sounds hard. Where do you find the snow? What kind of gear do I need? What, what sort of training is required for that? And I think those are all super important questions, but I think fundamentally it comes down to having the inspiration to do it. So the next 60 to 90 minutes or so, I'll definitely walk you through some of those nuts and bolts. But mostly, I want to show pictures and I want to tell stories and hope to inspire you guys to take on a project like this for yourself. Because I think you'll find like a lot of us have, that once we stop being, being a seasonal skier and keep on exploring the outdoors the whole year round, you'll never go back. My own Endless winter started uh, in November 2011. A lot of you guys probably skied in November. You see the resorts open up around Thanksgiving. How many people have skied in November? There we go, just about everybody. But am I right? Usually Thanksgiving is getting a little bit late for you. You know, powder's already showed up in the mailbox a couple times. Maybe you got some skis uh, in the summertime on super clearance. They're just sitting in your garage waiting. And you're chomping at the bit to get up skiing long before the resorts are ready to open. And, uh, you know, maybe the first time Steve Poole gets on the news and says, hey, uh, you know, it's snow to put up in the mountains. You're like, okay, how do I get that? What do I do next? I was there that November in uh, 2011, and thought to myself, well, where do you go? And at that point, I did a little research and discovered the year-round skier's best friend. My 
Mount Rainier National Park. Now, the story of Mount Rainier National Park and the skyline of the park is dominated by Mount Rainier itself, but there's a lot more going on in the park. If you turn around from that exact same vantage point, you see this mountain right here, which is called the Tattoo Range. And the Tattoo Range is a lot easier to navigate in the storm, uh, a lot more ways to travel if there are avalanche conditions. But since it's right next to Mount Rainier, it benefits from a lot of early season storms that come in hard and heavy when they hit the mountain. And so oftentimes the Tattoosh Range has snow long before Crystal Mountain or any of the other resorts in the state are ready. So we decided that would be a good idea. But also, if you've ever experimented skiing in November, you know that it can be a bit of a mixed bag. Maybe one day it's snowing, the next day it's raining, the next day it's sunny, the next day it's hailing. And nothing has encapsulated that for me as much as the outing that uh, my friend Matt and I and a couple other buddies took into the Tattoosh that November. So here's Matt climbing up uh, one of the slopes that we were planning on skiing. And what is going on with that snow? That is weird looking. So what happened there is uh, Steve Poole got on the news and said, we're going to have a new snow up the mountains. And then you know, we activated and said, that'll be sweet. And then in the meantime, before the weekend rolled around, we got a chance to get up there. It rained. And it rained hard. It rained really hard. It's the kind of thing where the neighbors over in the backyard are building a giant boat and bringing in animals. And uh, so much so that the snow couldn't absorb all of the rain. And it had to shed it all off. And so all of the striations you see in the snow are actually basically rain gutters with the snow trying to get rid of all the rain. And you're saying to yourself, well, that is a horrendous recipe. And I would agree with you, except that if you look closely, there is uh, four to six inches of powder on top of that. A little digression here. I was born and raised skiing in Washington, and so I'm pretty, pretty liberal with my use of the word "powdy." <laughs> There's a benefit to this, however, which is if you call a lot of snow powder, basically, as far as I'm concerned, it came out of the sky more white than wet as powder. And if I call it that, then I start thinking of it as powder. And it's amazing how I find that I have so much, so many more powder days than the average person. <laughs> and if you're at all entertaining the notion of uh, skiing in any of these fringe months, I think you might want to adopt the same way of thinking. It improves the prognosis on a lot of your days out. So anyhow, here we are skiing some very great affected snow and making the best of it. And uh, they say in photography circles that really good weather isn't how you get the best images. It's when the weather gets interesting when the, and when conditions are non-standard that you get really interesting pictures. And, I, and that was definitely the case on this day. Sorry, I had to switch remotes because the Wi-Fi died on my iPhone there. Okay, so this is just looking across the valley in the other direction. And I love how much is going on in this picture. In the background, you've got the darkest storm clouds imaginable. And then in the mid-ground, there's a snowstorm going on, like a pretty significant snowstorm. And then in the foreground, for some reason, everything is completely illuminated. The sun decided to pop out and make our little slice of the world just a dream come true. And then all that texture you see from the rain running down into the snow ran down to this lake bed here and then eventually drained out right there. And holy smokes, I've never seen anything quite like that. And then, well heck, why not just pop out and say hi, Mount Rainier? <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you're in the park on a stormy day and you see Mount Rainier, it's a, it's a blessing. And to catch it with the, all the rest of the conditions combined is truly spectacular. And then that's, you know, again, in a similar spot, just looking back into the sun. And I love the, the depth and the length and the shadow that the sun made on that catch of snow. So, while the skiing on that day was maybe less than spectacular, you know, we got to see and experience all this stuff. We got to go out and explore. And while a lot of other people were sitting on their couches at home waiting for the lifts to start running, we were out there doing this. So skiing in November has its upside. So, 
long comes December, and by the time December rolls around, things are starting to uh, improve a bit. Generally speaking, in the Northwest, once winter starts, it comes hard and fast, and it doesn't really let up until springtime. So in this particular December, um, by the time we are halfway through the month, Snow Lake, which is over in the Alcohol Valley, was already totally frozen over, and you can ski right across it. Now, how many people have been to Snow Lake up in the Alcohol Valley in the wintertime? It's nice, but a few years. And what about in the summertime? About the same, that's, that's awesome. See, in the, in the summertime, lots of people head there, it's easy to get to, it's close to Seattle, it's a beautiful hike, and then you have this deep blue alpine lake, and the towering cliffs coming off of Chair Peak, setting it off, and it's a spectacular landscape. And it's no less spectacular in the wintertime, even perhaps more so, when the entire lake bed becomes this open horizon, and this giant expanse, which is hard to find in that day, and then counting the cliffs set that off. But there's an added benefit to going up the Snow Lake in the wintertime. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Have you ever been, you know, you, you leave from Seattle, you're leaving from somewhere in Bellevue or whatever, and you decide to head up to the mountains for the day, and the weather's totally reasonable, maybe it's sunny, maybe there's high clouds, and uh, you're saying to yourself, well, this will be nice, and you drive through, it's a bossy thing, through North Bend, same thing, and then you get to that last turn, right before you hit the pass, and whammy, wall of fog, and you can't see anything, it's totally deflating, you're like, I have to spend all day up in this cold fog when I could have just stayed down in the city and it was sunny? This is horrible. But there's a way out of it, and the way to do, get out of it is to go west. And you can do that at Snow Lake. So that horseshoe shape there is Snoqualmie Pass. And then the valley that's leaving from right up above Snoqualmie Pass goes up into the Alcatel Valley, and then eventually up into Snow Lake. And so by the time you're to Snow Lake, you're a fair bit west. And then there's the added benefit of that thing you can see right in front of Snow Lake. That's called the Snow Lake Divide. And it's a really defined ridge line there. And what that is, is that's basically the first thing that can stop the weather from the east side of the pass, which is that cold, foggy, disgusting air that makes freezing rain and temperature inversions and everything to eight. That's the first thing that can stop it. And so I can't tell you how many times I've left alcohol, left my car alcohol in the fog and freezing cold, and then gone out and over that pass, and at some point on Snow Lake, all of a sudden the fog stops. And you ski across it and you're back in the same wonderful conditions you were when you left your house in Seattle. <laughs> so here's another example of this is just basically a couple of guys right about to walk into that giant wall of fog. And then this is looking uh, to the east side of Snow Lake. You can see that cold air just flowing into the lake, but then it just holds. And so you're saying, okay, so if this is a sort of a solution, now we have a lake we can go to when the skiing is bad. But that's pretty boring. <laughs> but there's also well, there's actually really great skiing right around there. There's uh, the slopes off of Chair Peak, off of Mount Roosevelt. You can do a really cool tour around Chair Peak, off of Chair Peak Surf Navigation. Um, there's a book that's no longer imprinted, but you can get online, uh, written by Mark, Martin Vulcan, who is a Swiss mountain guy who got a shop up in North Bend. It's called uh, Backcountry Skiing Snoqualmie Pass. And it's got everything you need to know about finding good places to ski up in that region. How long? How do you get to this? No, like, I mean, you go from. Uh, you go from uh, the parking lot in Alpenthal, and then you you uh, basically skin up to the end of that valley, and then you come up that uh, how long? that path there. Long? It's only a you know a couple hours. So then moving on to January. Now I said a little bit ago that when winter starts in the Cascades uh, back in you know, November, December. It doesn't really stop until spring. But I kind of lied with it. I'm sorry for that. There is one thing that happens most winters. It happened this winter, it happened the previous winter, it happened the winter before that. And that's the what's called consistent high pressure, or persistent high pressure, which is basically no new snow for a long time. <coughs> and for the resorts here, that's an absolute disaster. You know, it's icy groomers, scratchy moguls, no soft snow to be found anywhere. Um, but there's a flip 
flip side of that, for, for the backcountry skier, you have two things that are pretty hard to come by in the wintertime in the Northwest, which are visibility and stability. And when you have those two things, the entire high cascades open up. And it's a range that is unrivaled in most parts of the world. And to be able to travel deep into it in the middle of winter is something spectacular. On this January outing, we headed up into what's called the Chihuahua Mountains. And the Chihuahua Mountains are a pretty long, arduous approach. It's a relatively remote part of the Cascades. Um, but if you've ever been on the east side of, or on the back side of Stevens Pass and looked to the east and seen a really clean line of big, jagged granite peaks, you were looking at the Chihuahua Mountains. So, my friend Matt, who's the guy in this photo there, hi Matt. Hi. We were, uh, <laughs> pretty deep into a long day in the Chihuahuans and got to a saddle on this ridge line. And I looked over to the right and I saw that, that line of light going up towards that peak. And I went from, at that point, from being a good ski partner to being a good photographer, a role which my friend may or may not enjoy. So I said, hey Matt, do me a favor, throw your skis on your shoulder and heck up that up that But very much appreciate the effort. It, uh, it turned out great. It's one of the more iconic climbing shots I have in my collection. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to actually this year, so I'm sort of cheating um, because this is outside of the scope of the single year I'm covering. But again, this is January, it was a couple months ago, we had another one of these high pressure systems that came in and it didn't snow for like three weeks and everybody was miserable, except for the people going out and climbing and skiing stuff all over in the high cascade. And uh, a few of us got out and, and got to ski something that I'd been trying to ski for a number of years and conditions had never just been, had just never been right. And so uh, we got up there and got it done and I made a little video of it that I thought I'd uh, share with you guys. Yo. Columbia Peak. Right there. Everything else, right there. Good conditions for climbing. Skiable if that gets soft, but f if it doesn't. Might be a fragile bridge right here. Yep, fragile bridge. Hold. I'd be scared dropping into this if I didn't climb it. Real scared. I mean, I'm gonna be scared dropping into it regardless. Yeah, buddy. So far, so good. About to go down, dude. Columbia Peak. Yeah, yeah. This is sick up here. Mount Stewart, Mount Rainier. The Olympics, Seattle down in the fog, Mountain Loop Zone, Mount Baker, Jackson.
Everything. Outstanding. That was alright. Alright, I'll start uh
often. My car drove across the Palm Pass over to Clay Elm and then up into uh, the Tianaway Valley, which accesses one of the trailheads you can get at to uh, get at Mount Stewart from from the southeast side. And they had been doing some uh, midwinter logging, which meant that the road was plowed a lot further towards the trailhead than it generally is in the wintertime. And uh, so we got across the pass, we got over the valley, it was good and dark out, but we were able to uh, sort of white knuckle, claw scratch, and slide our way in my old blue Ford Ranger up to the end of the logging and uh, got within a semi reasonable approach for uh, the middle of the night. And popped on our skis and packs and uh, we were able to climb all the way up to the, to the saddle up above Mount Stewart, uh, more or less by moonlight. It was a very, very good. And you may be saying to yourself, you know, oh gosh, I'm up in the middle of nowhere in the middle of winter at night. It sounds like a bad idea. And there is definitely that perspective. But at the same time, you may, if you don't uh, entertain notions like that, you may never pop up at the top of the ridge on a Friday after work and see something like Mount Stewart illuminated by moonlight with a fresh coat of snow on it. So, we got to this spot up above, uh, up at uh, what's called Eagles Pass, and decided to set up camp there. Actually, Matt set up camp. I set up a tripod and started taking pictures. <laughs> as Matt, uh, as Matt endeavored into the age-old battle of tent versus windstorm, <laughs> which he eventually won, but the wind was no nothing short of full howling when uh, when we finally got the tent set up and uh, knocked out for a few hours of sleep. We were setting up for an alpine start. We had, I think, a 3 a.m. alarm clock. Alpine start is a term that's used in mountaineering and backcountry skiing, and it basically means any time you would set your alarm, it sounds completely ridiculous. <laughs> in this case, 3 a.m. So, crawled in the tent. Across the valley of the runway just taken, 
and uh, saw that. <laughs> and the late afternoon light had just glanced over the ridge line and illuminated all the snow that we had just kicked up and made this really surreal, almost angelic uh, sense to the scene. And initially for me, that was just a, a really nice picture that brought back good memories from this ski mission. And then last year I donated it as a, uh, I donated a, a frame piece um, to a fundraiser for the guys uh, from Leveler who died in recent avalanches. And at that point this piece took on new meaning to me. Uh, I, I titled it Forever in Our Mountains. And it came to represent the permanence in the transitory. Just as these ski tracks are gone, but through this picture and, and through the feelings it evokes, it still lives on. Uh, our friends who we've lost in the mountains, through our memories of them and through our deep connection to the natural world, live on. And as long as we continue to invite them into our hearts and into our souls and into our trips, they'll be forever in our mountains. And I always like to keep that in mind. Marching on. If you want to. Good sign. We 
sure. So we can laugh ourselves. Well, let's go ahead with this. This might work out. Started walking through the woods there, and uh, it's funny when you have a headlamp on, it's dark and you're in the forest and it's snowing really hard, you get disoriented pretty, disoriented pretty quickly. But we kind of managed our way, but as we went, the snow was just increasing in volume. And when we got up to the tree line, where uh, you pop out here at the base of what's called Hematro Bridge, uh, <coughs> it was hammering snow, it was windy, there was very little visibility, and the new snow wasn't attaching itself very effectively to the rain crust that's left over from uh, all the horrendous weather. So we decided we were more or less uh, out of luck. We started skiing back down in the car, wondering if 5.30 in the morning was too early to start enjoying the little beers. <laughs> and then the snow tapered off. And then it stopped. And we were, uh, you know, maybe a quarter of the way to the car, and kind of looked around. Decided we got absolutely nothing to lose, and so put our skin back on our skis and started climbing back up the tree line. And when we got back up there the second time, the clouds had kind of parted, and fog had lifted, and there was some, you know, some open sky, and we could see enough that we could put together a safe route up here to throw bridge and start to get up on the upper mountain. And then once we got up onto the glacier, things got truly spectacular. Once we got up there, the sun popped out and started lighting up this new, new fallen snow and the texture on it, and we had this incredibly beautiful canvas to walk across. And as a photographer, I wanted to hang out and shoot for as long as possible. But every time I would stop and shoot, my party would start putting some distance on me. <laughs> because everyone knew that time was sort of a, of the essence. If you've ever uh, traveled around on a glacier, things change drastically when you can see versus when you can't see. And right then, we could see, and the can't see could have happened at any second, so everybody was in full go mode. But <laughs> as they continued to gain distance on me, it got to a point where photographically I was very happy with it because it gave a, it gave a beautiful sense of the scale of the place and just the overwhelming majesty of that environment. And so I stayed back and popped up a few more pictures and eventually ended up with this one here, which is a panoramic that, uh, that I made by taking a bunch of different pictures and then stitching them together to get that really wide format. And that kind of tells the whole story. You know, you see this churning weather all down in the valley, and then this miraculous hole in the sky, and the clouds doing something that I didn't know clouds could do, as the party reaches up, up towards the saddle and the base of Mount Baker there. So eventually, I caught up to those guys at that low point between those two peaks. Actually, I didn't catch up with them, they waited for me. <laughs> See, I think those guys from Montana are actually genetically modified. <laughs> the previous day, when we were uh, trying to climb a mountain over in Stoplomy in the rain, uh, one of those guys named Zach skimmed past me, and I thought to myself, okay, I'll keep up with Zach. You know, I'm not the fastest guy in the world, but I get out a lot. And then I'm finding myself not able to keep up with Zach, and consistently so. And all of a sudden, Zach is just distant memory, except there's this essence still lingering, which is cigar smoke. <laughs> the whole time Zach passed me and then continued to drop me and leave me in the dust, he was smoking a cigar. <laughs> so, in the wake of these super freaks, we made, uh, we made good time up at the summit of Mount Baker. I didn't have any good for pictures because we were basically running the whole time, but when we got up there, we were astounded to find that in every direction, everything was covered in clouds. From the Pacific Ocean, out to the desert, from Oregon to Canada, you can usually see all of that from the top of Mount Baker. All there was was a sea of clouds. No rain here above the clouds, no glacier peak, nothing. Just this window of heaven over Mount Baker. And we got to see 7,000 feet of powder all the way back to the car. So, as you enter into the Northwest backcountry, never forget that it rewards optimism, sometimes. <laughs> All right, so, May, let me say this, the crater rim on Mount St. Helens is awesome. I had, uh, I can't figure out how I've lived here my whole life and I've never been to the top of Mount St. Helens until this spring. And I might have gone another 34 years 
without doing it. Uh, but I was prompted and inspired by a friend whose name is uh, Chris Davenport. Some of you guys may have heard of him. He's um, one of the better ski mountaineers in the world right now. He's guided on Everest and Antarctica. He's the only person to have ever skied um, all of Colorado's 54, 14,000 foot peaks in a single year. The guy is an absolute machine. But he decided to park all that last, uh, last May and come out to the west and ski all the volcanoes that are in the west, basically starting at Lassen Peak down in California and then doing everything in California, Oregon, and finishing off up in, uh, at Mount Baker in Washington. So I was honored and uh, lucky enough to get to join those guys for a couple of days on that mission, skiing Mount Adams one day and then Mount St. Helens the following day. And I gotta be honest, it hurt really bad. <laughs> See, it made the, uh, the trailhead snow, the roads aren't snow free after the trailhead. So you end up having to park your car quite a ways from where you would normally start climbing those mountains. And so on the, the Mount Adams day, we had to climb about 9,000 feet. And on the Mount St. Helens day, which was the next day, we had to climb about 7,000 feet. And while those guys had been getting warmed up down in the uh, volcanoes of California and Oregon, I had been spending a vast majority of my time at my desk, and struggled to keep up. There they are, climbing up sort of the lower stretch of Mount St. Helens, getting a little further away from me. I'll catch up, guys. <laughs> but uh, as is so often the case, the nausea and the whole sunscreen and the eyes thing and the blood sugar crashes and that hanging sensation that your next step is going to be your last one on earth. All have kind of faded into the background and what's left is, you know, these pictures and these views and these memories and, and the friendships. And, you know, you can't tell once you get to this point where we're on top at the past blue ribbon that anybody had a bad time. In fact, we had a great time. So much so that uh, there's me and Chris on top of St. Helens. Um, so I'm planning on heading down this way to Colorado to, uh, to hook up with him and join him on some of his latest project, which is to attempt to be the first person to ever ski the 100 tallest peaks in Colorado. So that should be absurdly painful. I mean, that should be a really good time. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, on to June, now we're starting to get into uh, the latter part of the season. So far, we've been all of the day. In June, your options start to narrow a little bit. A lot of the stuff in the lower mountains isn't looking so good anymore. And so we ended up deciding to go ahead and revisit, revisit Mount Baker. Treated us so nicely in April. Why not see what it would do in June? So we headed up in that direction, and we traded in the sort of nice weather and fantastic powder for perfect weather and really pretty firm snow. But again, we found ourselves up on the uh, up on the glacier basically at sunrise, and it was spectacular in a different way, but spectacular nonetheless. I decided photographically to, to focus on different things and to focus on basically just the form and shape of the glacier at the first light day, and that was equally satisfying for me. Here's uh, here's the first light on some of the big heating ice blocks that uh, they're called seracs. Out when the glacier goes around, just a couple of ski tracks across there, and just a very simple, very clean, very beautiful scene. Just so you know, just so you know, I'm not lying to you about the whole thing being epic on that day. There's sunrise at Mount Baker, so you can't blame us for coming back there a second time. Equally spectacular was my buddy Eric's uh, line of descent from the summit, but in conditions. This here is called the Coleman Headwall. It's uh, kind of off the northwest corner and leaves mostly uh, from the summit of Anchor. And if you look really closely right there in the center of the frame, you see a very small speck, which is Eric. Now, <laughs> Eric and, uh, and, and myself and our other ski partner, Brian, all kind of went up to look down this thing. And the snow was not good. It was really not good. And, uh, <laughs> Ryan and I decided not to go there. 
I was teaching I was born, and then that luckily put me in a decent position to put on a telephoto lens and uh, pop off a few frames of Eric right in the heat of battle there. So kudos to him for that one. I'm glad he did it and I didn't have to. Okay, so July. July is all about barbecues, beach volleyball, <coughs> ice climbing. Why not? So there's a route on Mount Baker. It's called the, uh, the North Ridge. And the North Ridge, for the most part, is a steep snow climb, but then it's got a couple of spots where it uh, ramps up and has a little bit of uh, nearly vertical ice to climb. And so when that idea was hatched, I decided, hey, that sounds like fun. I'm climbing my fair share of July, and I'm climbing my fair share of snowy slopes. Don't really need to repeat that. So let's, let's try this out. But I'm getting my head ahead of myself here. Let's quickly uh, talk about the picture that uh, came to represent July in this project here. So this is, again, early in the morning on the Coleman Glacier, but again, so different. Uh, an interesting thing happens between April and July where the snow that was, you know, basically needed to be powdered in April takes on this form in July. This is called what's called sun cups, where the snow melts in a certain formation and it makes a texture across the entire surface of the glacier. <coughs> and it was really fun to take a picture of. You see a couple of climbing parties coming up from Heliotrope Bridge over there. And I love how just every square inch of this scene has texture and depth and it's like a charcoal drawing on a, on a rough matte cotton paper. And so I spent uh, spent an hour or so that morning just kind of wandering around the glacier, shooting all this texture and all this all this crazy contrast in these sun cups in the early light. And I, you know, I love how the actual movement of the glacier translated into that shot. And then to give you another perspective of, of the whole scene, you know, there's the entire not the entire place. And it's really interesting to revisit this spot, you know, multiple times a year and see how it changes and how it's always spectacular, but it's always very different. So we went from that little entertaining uh, hangout to stepping it up a notch. This is uh, the first pitch of the climb on the, uh, the ice there in the North Ridge. And then here we have uh, Brian actually climbing the ice. And I think it was actually going pretty well until the lightning came. And, you know, maybe you're thinking, well, oh, lightning doesn't seem like such a big deal. And let us look over your shoulder and you see skis and ski poles with metal edges and stuff <laughs> sticking up off your pack a couple of feet. And then you look over your other shoulder and you see a bolt of friggin' lightning hit the next peak to the, to the north. And, uh, and this thunder, and I'm not talking about the sort of thing where you got the lightning, and then you count one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand. Distant thunder, okay, I can deal with that. This was kind of more like lightning thunder. <laughs> it's just happened. So, so we got together quickly on our uh, on the anchor that we had set up. Uh, do you think we should maybe get off of here? I don't know, you know. Might not be getting worse, well, it's certainly not getting any better than another bit of thunder and short story. We decided to pull off of that route and thus was awarded the North Ridge Mount Baker. But even from the bottom of that climb, we still had about 4,000 feet of good corn to ski all the way to the car, so uh, the skiing was just fine. August. Yikes. Where do you find snow in August? I don't know. You can find this. Oh, that's uh, somebody Rory up there snowboarding on this stuff that looks more like rock than snow. And it, it skied more like rock than snow as well. And uh, the funny thing about it is where we came from. That's earlier today. We've got wildflowers, the birds are chirping, a gentle breeze, the sunshine. Anyone in their right mind stays there, right? Because this is what was happening higher up on the mountain. Fog and wind, hard dirt sometimes instead of those charming ones we saw earlier. So eventually we climbed up above that cloud and uh, found 
this little jam to get our August turns in on. And to say the snow was hard would be a, an understatement. Um, it's funny, so up to a certain point in the spring, the snow keeps getting softer and softer and softer. And so you would think it would continue to do so into August and September. But that's not what happens. The all the snow that has the capacity to get soft is long gone. And it's down in the valley and people are fishing out of it and surfing it. <laughs> and all that's left is basically like the cockroaches after the apocalypse. <laughs> it's hard and ugly and mean and built to last. So that's what we had up there in August. <laughs> so we got our turn box checked for the month and uh, threw our pack back on and climbed back up for some more. <laughs> now, why did we do that? Well, there's a little bit of strategy to this. So this day here was August 31st, following morning, September 1st. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
said. <laughs> but again, it's hard to focus on something as inconsequential as the quality of the snow for skiing when compared to how absolutely mind-blowing the scenery and the scale is up there on Mount Rainier. And so you start to reshape how you're thinking about why you're in the mountains in the first place. Nonetheless, I promised myself after that I, I would not put my skis on again and put it snowed a while. <laughs> Which leads us to October. Now, I thought after surviving August and September, October will be a no-brainer. It'll snow up high and the sun will come out. We'll get on one of the easy glaciers on Rainier or Baker. We'll have a good time. We'll be casual. And I even saw a picture of you on the internet that that actually happened for some people. I miss that day. <laughs> Every day I looked to get out, the prognosis was absolutely horrendous. And I found myself getting on the phone and, and trying to sell the idea of going skiing to people. Like, hey, do you want to uh, see how skiing is? <laughs> no. No. Could be good. Pop the car, drive for three or four hours, and see if maybe, possibly, the snow at a certain elevation could be skiable. Uh, got that reason. And anyhow, eventually, we got a report that it said snow four to six inches down by Mount Rainier. Figured maybe there were some more up higher on the glaciers. I was uh, able to bribe my buddy Brian to come up with me and check it out. And as we're driving along on Highway 410, things were looking pretty good. The snow was nice and hard, the road was all white. I was thinking to myself, yeah, this is going to go easy. We're going to have a nice one here. And then my next thought was an audible one. And the next thought was, we're screwed. And it was actually not we're screwed. I used a different word, but since this is a family event, <laughs> I will say, I'll spare you that. Um, but as we came around the corner and saw a log all the way across the highway on a snowy road, and the brakes didn't do a darn thing, so we're screwed, you hit the log, and uh, luckily the only casualty was the front bumper of my car, the airbag stayed put, thank goodness, and we were able to through some uh, good old fashioned manual labor get ourselves off of the log and back on our way. So at this point I'm thinking, wow, oh, that's clearly got to be the worst thing that can happen to us, right? And then that happened. So that's the only road into that side of Mount Rainier National Park, and that park is where the glaciers are at. The glaciers are where the snow's at that you can actually ski on. Because our plan B and C were to go up to Chinook Pass and to go to Crystal, both of which we did, where we found four to six inches of new snow on top of rocks and dirt and grass. <laughs> and even the most intrepid year-long skier was nowhere in sight. It was completely unmanageable. So that day was an absolute failure. Except that I got a good picture. So, also then, well, to some extent, the following week, this is where I can find out who your really good friends are. Uh, hey Brian, you remember last week how we burned a whole day and a bunch of gas and food and crashed my car and didn't see anything? Yeah, you want to try again? No, I know things haven't really changed much, but uh, I have to get out and do this. See, at this point it was, that was October 21st. This next phone call happened October 27th. So if you remember, the first month of this little mission of mine was November. So all I had to do to complete my 12 months of consecutive skiing and this art project, which I already had a show book for, was to get out and ski in November. But there was no snow. Block was taken. Anyhow, we had heard more rumors that up at Mount Baker, there uh, might have been permanent snow up near Earth's Point above the ski area there. So we thought that would be sort of the easy money that we could get. So there Brian was, parking ride at 5 o'clock the next morning. Thank you for that, my good friend. And we pushed out towards, uh, towards Mount Baker, got through Glacier, Washington. Guess that. Yeah, I had to, I had to take a picture. I was like, dude, I got to take a picture of this. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Did this happen again? And that road, Highway 542, is the only way up to the Mount Baker ski area, which was our plan. We were 
saved yet again by Mount, by Mount Baker via Heliotrope Bridge. The road for which leaves just about a quarter mile before that sign. And we were able to drive on to where we hit snow, hiked for a long ways, and eventually found winter fish. <laughs> now, to say that, uh, yeah, it wasn't good skiing. It wasn't good skiing. The, that, that powder there is probably the wettest, most wind packed powder I have ever come across. And then the weather was kind of like being in a blizzard, only a lot wetter. <laughs> and, uh, and the coverage, well, let's just say the skis I was on on that occasion have since been sold on Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> but as we pulled up the bar stool down at the Chair 9 restaurant, Shannon Glacier, after skiing this, uh, this wonderful set of conditions here, the particulars of the day were overshadowed by the fact that I had done it. I had gone out to ski every month of the year in Washington, had seen every condition mountains can throw at you, and I was really satisfied and I was really proud. But mostly I was really thankful. I was really thankful for the friends that joined me on all these missions. I was really thankful that nature dished up so many spectacular scenes and environments. I was thinking of living in Washington where we have the capacity to go and do things like this month in and month out. Thankful to just be alive. And I was really thankful <laughs> for that piece of beer. That was fantastic. <laughs> I get hungry. Um, and that was, uh, that was just October of last year, and I was inspired by the whole project, and I have skied every month since then, and I don't expect I will stop skiing any time soon. And so, going through this process gave me a deep sense of inspiration, and I hope that me sharing it with, it with you guys passes some of that on, because it's a deeply fulfilling experience, and I couldn't recommend it more highly. I want to thank you very much for your time. I want to thank REI for hosting this event. Thanks to Cliff Bar for the tasty snacks, and make sure to grab all of those on your way out. And uh, let's see, this is how you can keep uh, in touch with me on the old internet. My website is scottrink.com, Facebook slash my name, which you might want to take a picture of because it's hard to spell. Twitter 